Greetings, I'm John Spirit. I'm March Ezekiel. We have so much power at last because we have found the ultimate cheese, and welcome to Sky Greg Super Shorts. Remember how I said you can only combine two combustion generators at a time because you can't share maintenance hatches or muffler hatches in the middle? And you need five hatches per machine if you want to oxygen boost them, which is of course necessary. That was made under the tacit assumption that we couldn't share fluid input hatches because there's no way to access, for example, this block where the input hatches will be shared. You may be wondering, what is this entangled block here, and what could it possibly be doing? This entangled block is putting oxygen gas in this ULV input hatch. If this ULV input hatch were buried in between these two multi-blocks, the entangled block could still put oxygen gas into it which means we could share fluid input hatches between multi-blocks, as long as we used entangle blocks to access them. And that is why we have created a tower of 12 large combustion engines, each of which shares all of its fluid input hatches with another multi-block. All of the maintenance hatches and muffler hatches are on the outside of the tower. Shared horizontally between two multi-blocks are oxygen and lubricant because export buses are pretty slow, but it's fine because we don't need much of either of those fluids. Shared vertically between different multi-blocks in the center are the input hatches for gasoline, which we are connecting up using our aluminum fluid pipes because those are a lot faster. Due to reasons, half of these generators are running off of cetane boosted diesel, which means they will consume our cetane boosted diesel very, very fast. But that just means that the whole base will switch to gasoline as it was intended to all along, one day. We're currently working on power storage, which we might do with a power substation or might right now just do with some IV battery buffers. But since that's taking a hot minute, I'm going to talk about progression instead. In order to move into LUV, we need rhodium-plated palladium. Each four rhodium-plated palladium ingots require one rhodium dust. And you can get two rhodium dust for every 12 inert metal mixture. But that's six runs of this centrifuge recipe, which takes 25 seconds per run. So we're going to upgrade to an EV centrifuge for this purpose. At EV, we can make 12 inert metal mixture in 75 seconds. And the amount of rhodium you get from that is enough for one whole LUV machine. To get rid of the useless platinum sludge residue, I am using an item voiding cover which I realized I did just stick willy-nilly onto a centrifuge full of incredibly precious materials. But thankfully, it's smart and doesn't turn on until you press the on button. Once I turned on the item void cover with its filter, the platinum sludge residue disappeared. All right, now this will run forever. This means we no longer need a recipe on this HV centrifuge making rarest metal mixture. Now you may be thinking, Jonathan, why are you making rhodium-plated palladium ingots, the LUV material? when something as simple as an LUV electric motor requires a fucking assembly line. The answer would be because I'm very dumb. So today is actually the assembly line episode. The assembly line is a multi-block which gets longer the more items you want to put in it. Every item input hatch has to be ULV, so it can only accept one item. One of the special ingredients required to make the assembly line casings is going to end up being ruridit dust, which is from ruthenium and iridium. And since both ruthenium and rhodium come from inert metal mixture, I might as well process them both at the same time. We currently already have a recipe that creates ruthenium. Making rhodium requires processing rhodium sulfate, which you get as a byproduct of making ruthenium tetroxide dust. So while I could create a recipe that makes rhodium sulfate and turns that into rhodium, I'm instead going to exploit the fact that rhodium sulfate automatically gets shoved into this HV electrolyzer. I'm going to create a recipe which ostensibly makes ruthenium. More accurately, I'm going to create a recipe which uses the products ruthenium tetroxide dust and carbon dust twice to make ruthenium. Since that causes two crafts of ruthenium tetroxide to occur, you get a total of one bucket of rhodium sulfate. And one bucket of rhodium sulfate automatically processes into two rhodium dust. And since that automatically happens, I can just whole rhodium dust into this crafting recipe. I'll put the rhodium recipe into the chemical reactor which already makes ruthenium. Now, if I request two rhodium, let's see what happens. Currently, that large chemical reactor is making our ruthenium tetroxide. Now it's processing in this chemical reactor. 
Ah, I believe the issue is that rhodium sulfate is treated as an output of the ruthenium tetroxide recipe, so I just need to change that. Let's try that again. As soon as the ruthenium tetroxide is done, we should see the rhodium sulfate force its way into this electrolyzer. Looks like it's just done that, and we've got our rhodium. As to the processing of iridium, it does take 20 seconds in an IV chemical reactor in order to make one equivalent iridium dust. So you'd think I'd want to run this all the time, but not quite. I do need these nether star dusts. So I'll continue to create iridium dust on demand as much as it pains me. We've created an IV mixer, so now we can make things like rhodium plated palladium dust, niobium titanium dust, and rubidit dust. Until we get a substantial amount of argon, which is annoying, we won't be able to smelt rubidit dust in our blast furnace main setup. But we also need RTM or HSSG alloy anyway, so that kind of sucks. RTM alloy requires tons of ruthenium, which I would rather use for something else, but we could upgrade our blast furnace array by turning into HSSG. HSSG is much cheaper than RTM alloy, mostly because it doesn't require any ruthenium. Unfortunately, it does require an exorbitant amount of time in an electric blast furnace um, that requires RTM alloy, so if I start it now, it won't be done for 2 hours and 40 minutes. So I guess I'm starting it now. HSSG coils also require tungsten carbide, but we already made that. Tungsten carbide dust is just tungsten and carbon in an EV mixer. And you can even make it with nichrome. I have decided, after looking through all the assembly line recipes, that I'm going to go with a 9 length assembly line for now in order to make everything LUV. By far, the most expensive part of the assembly line is the assembly line casings. The EV circuits are, I guess, fine. The IV motor and tungsten steel frame I can live with. The HPIC chip is annoying. But the real progression problem here is the quantum stars we need for IV emitters. I have to actually automate radon gas. Thankfully, Arch is working on that right now. What I will work on instead is making nether stars. The implosion compressor is one of the steps in this process. It's a very cheap power multi-block, but it does require some HV circuits, which who cares? To make nether star dust, you need some of that precious, rarest metal mixture, polytetrafluoroethylene, which we have, and calcium chloride dust. The calcium chloride dust can either come from sticking calcite and salt in an electric blast furnace for some reason, or chemical bathing shelite dust. Previously, we've been using that to make tungsten. As a result, we've been shoving the calcium chloride into an electrolyzer, I guess because I thought I could just make calcium chloride again, which was kind of dumb of me. This is, obviously, too annoying to put into our blast furnace system. Since crafting storages retain items that are outputs of crafting recipes inside them until a crafting recipe is finished, if we set up a recipe that makes calcium chloride from shelite dust, and then use that specifically to make nether stars, the calcium chloride dust won't get unceremoniously dumped into an electrolyzer before we can use it. So that's what we'll do. I'm putting this nether star dust recipe into the EV chemical reactor where it's required to go anyway. I've decided to combine the implosion compressor with the large inscriber simply because it's maximally convenient. The costs are negligible, I just want things to be easier. Arch has pointed out that using one HV energy hatch for two HV multi-blocks while you only have one singular MV generator pointing into a 4x battery buffer might be a little bit of a bad idea, because we might not be able to run both the machines at once. Thankfully, I have a solution. In order to make sure that these two machines never run at the same time, they are now sharing input bus. This pattern provider is set to lock crafting until primary crafting result is returned. It's going to have the recipes for both the logic processors and the nether star. So it is impossible for these two machines to ever run at the same time. This is very dumb. And the multi-block has formed. Alright, we can now make us some nether stars. It looks like the system is indeed storing the calcium chloride instead of stuffing it into an electrolyzer to destroy it and ruin it forever. And the implosion compressor should run momentarily. Hello, within the, within the confines of this video. And the implosion compressor should run momentarily. And the implosion compressor should run momentarily. The one problem with this is that the ULV output bus can't store both Dark Ashes and Nether Stars, so I need to turn it into an LV output bus. That solves the problem. While I continue to wait for Arch to finish Uranium Hexafluoride, I'm working on fixing our blast furnaces with our lovely new IV Dynamo hatches. 
I just need some extreme voltage transformers to turn the IV power into EV power and power my blast furnaces. If you recall, we originally meant for each per each combustion generator to power three EV blast furnaces, and then to have these remaining eight combustion generators fuel the remaining two. The remaining two are basically plug-and-play thanks to our high-voltage 4X transformer, which already deals with the issue of needing to take four amps in on any given side. This is Archer's system to make uranium dust. The recipe takes 40 hydrogen gas and makes uranium dust. 40 hydrogen gas gets shoved into this- can this bronze drum even fit it all, Arch? For some reason, it just works. I will not pretend to understand the esoteric workings of Greg Tech and AE2 in the same room. Anyway, all that hydrogen gets shoved into an advanced chemical reactor, which takes fluorine from this aluminum drum. Yeah, no, I guess it's just working. That makes a bunch of hydrofluoric acid, which gets dumped into this advanced chemical reactor with excess fluorine and uraninite dust. The uranium hexafluoride gets turned into both depleted and enriched uranium hexafluoride and slowly dumped into this electrolyzer. As it so happens, this electrolyzer makes fluorine in exactly the same amount that this system used it, so that fluorine gets dumped back into this drum in a perfect fluorine loop. We get the uraninite dust for this system from nether uraninite ore in an electric furnace. The fluorine loop is the reason our recipe only uses hydrogen. We decided that the cost in hydrogen was acceptable considering radon is basically just a crafting ingredient once in a while. It was simply not worth setting up a massive distillation tower just for radon. To make the 16 quantum stars we need for our 9 size assembly line, we need to shove another star and radon gas into a chemical bath. I'm thinking of using the HV chemical bath, but the quantum star recipe does take 96 seconds, so it's gonna take a good 25 minutes, basically, in this chemical bath. But I don't know if I really want to use 12 minutes of EV power in the EV chemical bath. I think it's fine. It's not like we need the quantum stars right now. 16 quantum star to- oh, we're missing air. Alright, we also needed enough plutonium in the system, but now we can finally start the relatively long craft. Since we're about to head to bed before we finish up this episode later, we finally decided to start the recipe for 16 Labatronic Energy Orbs. I think we actually need two more, which Arch is queuing up as well, to make our power substation. And now Arch will tell you how all those recipes work. The next thing I want to cover is how we made these IV Labatronic capacitors. They're used in the power substation multi-block. We'll cover what that's for soon. The IV Lapatronic capacitor is made of the Lapatronic Energy Orb and a Tier 1 capacitor in a canner. The Tier 1 capacitor is made in an assembler with various ultimate parts. Ultimate is just nickel dust, chromium, cobalt dust, and molybdenum dust in an EBF at each V tier. The Lapatronic Energy Orb is a doozy hover requiring fiber reinforced printed circuit boards, MPIC chips, engraved Lapatron crystal chips, nano CPU chips, fine platinum wire, and platinum plate. You may have noticed by now that the circuit board is also used to make quantum processors. But as it turns out, everything we needed for circuits also happens to be needed for Lapatronic energy orbs, so we're already prepared. The new ingredient, the engraved Lapatron crystal chips, are made in a laser engraver with a sapphire lens. You get three Lapatron crystal chips for one Lapatron crystal, which is the EV tier battery. We automated this in a previous episode, so it was really easy to get the IV Lapatronic energy orbs up and running. However, energy orbs take so many Lapatron crystal chips, and we wanted 18 energy orbs to start, so it took a really long time to get everything crafted. But they are canning as we speak. Behold, the promised substation. The Lapatronic energy capacitors are now here. The palladium substations were probably one of the most expensive parts of this, largely because of the iridium. The palladium you can just get using... Palladium ore, which you just smelt, and then you have it. One thing we've done with our amazing so much IV power is run an LUV blast furnace, pretty much constantly. The last very interesting thing we discovered is that multi-blocks like the large chemical reactor overclock four times for every energy tier. Our acetone recipe, which originally cost 20 seconds to run in this HV chemical reactor, we've upgraded it to EV, and now it only takes 5 seconds, which is amazing. And it makes all the large machines so much more worth it, because they overclock so much harder. I hope it pains you greatly to know that we will be using the large electrolysis chamber to turn water into hydrogen and oxygen at EV, so it'll take about 1 second per oxygen bucket. 
Because the distillation tower recipe is really terrible. Anyway, back to the assembly line. We have all our quantum stars. So we have basically all the important bits for the assembly line casings, but these assembly control casings need a few odd things. We've already talked about Ruridit, but the Ivy robot arms brought to our attention that we can't make electric motors right now because we need graphene and tungsten. Sorry, well we can get tungsten, but graphene. Graphene dust is a mix of carbon, silicon, and graphite. Graphite is just from a new ore. Before I up and actually request eight robot arms, I'm gonna try and see if fulfilling all of these many quests will get me some more. Not one robot arm. Just kidding, one robot arm. I'm smelting up the 40 Ruridit that we're going to need for the control casing gears, and making my 7 IV sensors, as well as my 7 IV emitters. Alright, now I can make my 14 assembly line casings. Now I'm crafting 19 assembly line gratings, and 29 solid machine casings. I already have 6. Alright, let's get these gears going. And now 10 assembly control casings. At last, the assembly line. For this multi-block, all of the input buses and hatches have to be at the bottom. Every input bus requires a new layer, and the output bus is in the final layer. Input hatches can be on the side. Energy can only be input into the top. Solid machine casings line the sides. Assembly control casings sit in the middle. Laminated glass, which apparently has a semblance of connected textures, surrounds the sides. Assembly line casings go on the middle of the top layer, surrounded by assembly line gratings, and one last line of solid machine casings caps the machine. We now have a working IV assembly line. Are we going to do anything with it in this episode? No. We are not currently really needing to make any of these LUV blocks, but it'll be important very soon. Anyway, time for a couple other last minute tidbits. We finally have the large electrolysis chamber. It is refilling our oxygen relatively quickly using just water. It's so fast. And since it's EV, we can conveniently power it with four combustion generators. That is less efficient than using those machines, but it's, it's fine. It has all of our electrolysis recipes except those which specifically require EV. That's because the goal of this electrolysis chamber is to surpass the normal overclocking. Since it's running at EV, it vastly surpasses the normal overclocking of LV, MV, and HV recipes. But it's no faster for EV recipes, so it's currently a waste to put any EV recipes into this machine. When we upgrade it to IV, however, we'll put all of our EV electrolysis recipes in it to get better overclocking out. Actually, producing it did not require any um, alloy blast smelter recipes. HSLA steel is just vanadium, titanium, molybdenum, and invar. The electrolytic cells just require tungsten, IV circuits, and platinum wires. The only doozy is that the large electrolysis chamber itself requires osmium wires. Osmium is smelted in an LUV blast furnace, and you can get it from osmium tetroxide, which we are just putting, we are getting in a distillery from acidic osmium solution, which is a byproduct of producing iridium. We've also set up a large chemical reactor for crafting in the clean room. It has every single chemical reactor recipe we have automated, except for the ones that are specifically EV and specifically IV, because for the same reason. This is an EV large chemical reactor. One last thing you should be aware of is that the process which makes iridium, we discovered, absolutely gobbles hydrochloric acid. So one thing we're going to do between episodes is make sure that there's a dedicated hydrochloric acid producer for this system. For now, however, that's it for today's episode. As always, if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. We hope you enjoyed!